And right out the gate, please allow me as well to extend our profound thanks to the folks of UGA's Innovation District who is serving as today's actual and also virtual host. And in case you're unfamiliar with what exactly the UGA Innovation District is, what is the innovation hub where we are sitting, I would love to introduce to you Ian Biggs, who is the Innovation District's Director of Startups and Programming, just to provide a bit of context with where you are. And I have a mic over here for you, sir. Wow. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Um, the Innovation District, the best way of thinking about that is we, at the university, we're not very good at seeing things as how industry sees them. And we tend to see things in academic silos. And so what we've tried to do with the Innovation District is bring together all of the assets we have that are anything to do with entrepreneurship, innovation, and commercialization. So around this area, we just on the other side of North Campus, we have the Student Entrepreneurship Center. We have the people who are responsible for patenting and licensing and the startup program are in Terrell Hall, which is just up there. We have the Small Business Development Center here and we're gradually moving any other parts of the university that relate to those three areas together. And that way we can actually address the needs of people um, from both ends, whether it is from faculty who've got an idea, who wish to get things commercialized, then we'll help push that out into industry. Or if it's industry that's got a problem that they need a solution for, then they can come in and we'll go and find the people who can actually solve that problem. Rather than just saying, nope, if you want this solved, you have to go and find the three different people who can put that together. Um, over the last oh, five or six years, the number of active projects based on faculty, um, intellectual property, ideas from research has gone up from a, a little around the 30 mark five or six years ago. We're now running at about 130 to 150 at any given time. And in the last five years, we've looked at 300 separate projects to push things out. Um, UGA right now is the number one university in the whole of the US for getting products actually into market. So that's what this is all about. It's all about bringing things together. This building was set up to be the hub of everything. Why well, it's called the hub. Um, and what we're trying to do here is use this as the landing place for anybody who's got an idea, wants got a problem that needs solving, or is just interested in what on earth's going on, come in here. So after this meeting, if you, if you want to look around the building and we can tell you its history, it is actually the reason, well, the reason why UGA is here is in this building. And we can explain all that to you after the meeting, something for you to look forward to. Okay, so Fantastic. thank you very much. Thank you. With that in mind, I'm gonna do everything I can to end this on time because to Ian's point, if you can stick around for a few minutes to meet these teams and also to tour this building, it is historically significant and it is exceedingly cool. Um, so I would love to create space for that. Additionally though, we have one other partner which I mentioned the UGA Wilson Center. I would love as well to introduce Dr. Nicholas Allen to tell us a bit about who and why and how this partnership started and just to give you some context on them. So Nicholas. Oh, this does sound a bit like one of those jokes, doesn't it? An Englishman and an Irishman come into a pub, which is perfect, given that we're <laughs> talking about brewing. Uh, I'm Nicholas Allen. I direct the Wilson Center for Humanities and Arts. And I'm here to tell you that actually the University of Georgia is here because of imagination, because of creativity, and that the humanities and the arts are at the very center of that prospect and enterprise. It's also at the center of community and thinking about how we relate to each other, thinking about how we relate to the planet in terms of sustainability, growing, brewing, and sharing. And I just really wanted to commend you, Matt, and the work you've done over the years in building that link to our local community and the communities that are around us. And just to say it's such a pleasure to be with you all after so many years of being apart. And we very much value you coming to be with us. I'm not allowed to have favorites, but Bell's Two Hearted Ale is a favorite. So thank you for all the very good work you do. When I meet these wonderful brewers, as we did with Alagash in Sierra Nevada, it's like meeting the people who make my favorite records. So you're very welcome to Athens. And I'd love to hear from you also about how thinking in its broadest sense has made such a difference in your industry in this community. But thank you all for being with us. And thank you, Matt, always. And now with my 
considerably less cool accent, I will uh, take it from there. Um, yes, as Nicholas just alluded to, this is our third year doing this, and really we have had the same kind of double-sided goal of each one of these conversations with different incoming breweries. One is to highlight how fascinating and dynamic and unique the craft brewing industry is, and that we essentially have competitors coming together not only to collaborate on new products, but new ideas, and then two, an extension further is we want to use this public opportunity to really talk about what it means to be not only a good brewery in our case, but a good company as well. And so with all that in mind, let's jump in and introduce the panel. Um, how I would love to introduce the panel is if we can just go down the line and if each of you will just answer, how did you get into beer? What are you doing here in terms of this industry, but also in terms of creature comforts and bells specifically? We'll start with you, Adam. Thanks, Matt. Um, and thanks everybody for showing up. Yeah, my name is Adam Beecham. I'm the chief operating officer and co-founder of Creature Comforts. I'm a double dog. I got a, a genetics and ecology degree back in 2005 uh, and you know, returned to the homeland of Athens to get this thing started back in 2013 and finally opened up in 14. Um, my role now is, is pretty diverse day to day. Um, I was never a business person before. I was a brewer and so a lot of drinking from a fire hose over the past few years, learning uh, just how to, you know, exist. And, uh, you know, I manage the supply side of the business. So that's like producing things. Um, and also the catalyst side, which is our sort of small brewery effort that you see in the tap room in downtown. So a uh, pretty diverse range of things. I kind of gravitate towards the science stuff. So I hang out in the lab a lot, just kind of, you know, troubleshooting issues and stuff. So production is my heart. So yeah, uh, that's me. Afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming out. My name is Walker Modic. I am the Environmental and Social Sustainability Manager for Bell's Brewery. How did I get into beer? Um, touchstone moment for me was probably between my junior and senior year of undergraduate. I signed on to do research on old factory response in salmon. <laughs> Had to go to Juneau, Alaska for that. And we were desperately poor, like living out of the back of a truck, sleeping in tents on park beaches. But Alaskan Brewing Company, if you took a tour, gave you two full beers afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> we took that tour almost every day for a month. Um, and I had their oatmeal stout. And that was the first time that beer was something other than sort of the, the classic macro experience. And that really was the launching point for what would become a long circuitous uh, career in beer. So, and I am of course here to, you know, help represent some of the work that Bells does, especially on the environmental impact side of our operations. Well, I'm John Mallett. Before I get started though, I'd love to turn it over to Carrie Dunker, who's on the screen, who's, who's just giant in this room right now. By the way. <laughs> Carrie. <laughs> Carrie, take it away. <laughs> Hi team, nice to see you all. Sorry, I can't be there in person. And then instead you have my giant floating head. Um, my name is Kira Yunker. I am the executive vice president here at Bells. Um, I've been here just shy of John's 20 years. Um, and my beer entrance story really is Bells. So I was going to school at Western Michigan, go Broncos, um, at the time and started at Bell's doing uh, reception work, really. So I didn't have to drink bad beer uh, is really my beer story. Thank you, Carrie. Now back to you, John. Certainly. So uh, yeah, I'm John Mallett. I've been at Bell's for just over 20 years now. Um, my beer genesis story starts in the mid 80s. I was in Boston and I decided that I did not want to be a chemical engineer. I think I memorably told my father, there's no way in hell that I'm spending my life watching liquid flow through pipes. Um, so, so there you go with that, dad. Um, I've worked in a number of different uh, brewery capacities over the years and then came to Bell's. And it, in my time at Bell's, I've, I've built the existing Comstock uh, brewery and then, and then operated it. Um, and it, one of the things I'm most proud of is not just the work that we've done inside the building, but the work that we do outside in the industry. So that is whether that's teaching, whether that's um, active involvement with professional organizations like the Master Brewers Association, the Americas, the Hop Quality Group, the Brewers Association, um, these types of, of organizations. This is really something that, that we hope to give back and, and to drive the conversation in a larger way for what beer in America can be. 
Hi everyone, I'm Allie Hellinga. I work as the community manager at Creature Comforts. And in my role, I help steward our company's primary give back campaign, Get Comfortable. And I won't spoil the end game because we will get there later. And you can definitely join us at the brewery after this to learn even more. Uh, but I'm also, and mind you, this is a self-proclaimed title. Our company is beekeeper or really the project manager behind our B Corp certification which we achieved in the summer of 2021. Um, and again, more on that to come throughout the panel as we continue to dissect that. But I am actually brand new to the brewing industry. I started at Creature in January of 2020, so coming on two years. And prior to joining Creature, I worked within higher education at both Wake Forest University and uh, my alma mater, the University of Georgia, Go Dogs. Thank you, Ali. Uh, my name is Fenwick Broyard. I'm the Vice President of Culture at Creature Comforts. Uh, how I got into beer, I mean, I, I think Chris, Heron, frankly, I mean, uh, I was running a nonprofit here in town and uh, this is, y'all are hearing feedback, right? I'm sorry. So yeah, I might be a little bit hot. I don't know, this one's a little hot. They told me they gave me this one because I can project so well and I feel like I'm overpowering it. So maybe I need to move it down a little bit. Is that, let's see if that helps. Is that better? Can y'all hear me? All right, cool, there we go. Um, no, I was running a nonprofit here in town and I got approached or introduced to the CEO of this brand new company who was interested in even, I mean, y'all were not even a year old at that point, wanted to have a conversation with me about how the company could be intentional about the type of footprint it would have in the community, which to me just sort of like signaled that something unique was happening. And I didn't know at the time that that was true of this industry. I learned that later that beer, the beer industry, craft beer industry is an incredibly generous and philanthropic industry. And that's one of the things that I've been very excited to discover now that I'm a, a part of the industry. But yeah, I mean, my introduction to the company came or to craft beer came through this company and specifically through this company's commitment to being the kind of corporate citizen that Athens would be proud to say existed within it. Uh, and I was attracted to that from the very first conversations we had and really hoped that an opportunity would eventually present itself to work at Creature Comforts. And uh, after I went away for a while and, uh, and, and went off and did a degree in divinity, uh, I got back to Athens. My uncle likes to say, I went from saving souls to selling suds. Um, so I, <laughs> I don't think they're a far cry when you, you know, Matt gave me a book to read when I first started at Creature, The Search for God in Guinness, um, which really was sort of transformative for me and, and, and exposed me to the, what a brewery really could be in and for a community. So I'm excited to, talk to these folks about the work that we're doing here and the work that you guys are doing up in Michigan. All right. Well, I'm a person who loves context, who loves a bit of backstory. And so this is a question primarily for Carrie and Adam and Mallet, just in terms of folks who have been with your brewery for some time. But what is the origin story? Where did these breweries come from? And really, I'm going to throw in a sub question there if you'd rather answer this as well. As organizations grow, some things necessarily must change, but some things must never change. <laughs> So also, as you talk about the origins and the growth of these companies, talk about what are those values or practices that um, were in place back then that will persist today and, and, and for the future as well. I would love to hear that. In fact, let's start with you, Carrie, since you are closest to me, technically. <laughs> sure. I feel like I'm closest to everyone. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I'll let, I'll let Mallet, he's, you know, he's been here the longest, so I'll get, let him give the origin story. What I'll say as far as answering the second part of your question, you know, what hasn't changed. I think we, we had a mantra sort of early on before we did formal work around, you know, vision, mission values, um, around people before process, you know, is something that we talked about, which I think will be fun to talk about and explore in this context around quality and processes and those pieces and how we measure them. But that really was some of the most grounding work that we did when we came time to hard decisions or who do we partner with? Um, how do we give back? It really, we had that mantra early on and I think that still exists and permeates throughout all of the spaces where Bells interacts in our communities. Awesome, John, take it from there. Yeah, so I mean, I think about Bells as a company that's gone through a number of stages. Initially, you know, Bells is a pretty old company in the world of craft beer, the oldest sort of craft brewery east of uh, the Rockies. And it starts by Larry Bell back in 1985 and, and like with 200 bucks that his, his mom gave him. And it has grown now to be, you know, pretty awesome brand. 
And it's gone through a number of different sort of stages. You know, part of those stages involved like wishing they could be bankrupt, but didn't have enough money to be bankrupt. So <laughs> needing to continue on, um, you know, fast forward, you know, 15, 20 years when Carrie and I start, it's now becoming a stable company. We codify a bunch of things. Um, you know, the, the brand continues to grow real focus on people and, and process. And, you know, most recently, the, the thing that's changed for us is that, you know, Larry at this point is um, getting a little bit older and decided he wants to step back. And, and, and the, so the succession planning there was to bring it into a larger form. And so recently, you know, as of the, the first of the year, we became part of a group uh, that Lion, one of the large brewers in Australia, um, has and so we've joined together with New Belgium Brewing and we're doing some integration work with them right now. So if this is a, a new chapter, but in a lot of ways it's a continuum because you know you kind of look at the mission, vision, values of the two companies, and there's a lot of crossover there. I mean, it's very well aligned. You know, sometimes you try and smash something together like chocolate and cheese, and it just doesn't work. And and this is really harmonious. So that you know. It, Give busy a basic idea of kind of where we've gone as an arc as a company and the codification of some of those great practices of how we treat people and how we interface with our community uh, have, have been there since since Larry started and, and was doing that as a, as a single individual. So anything to add, Carrie? You got it. Amazing. Um, yeah, um, so our, our version is, uh, yeah, it's kind of similar. You start with some things that are just inherent to you, and then you eventually get to codify them and make sure that it doesn't drift, right? Over time, as it gets bigger and bigger, it can be more challenging to have that in a, encapsulated in a way that is instantly understandable by everybody. But uh, when we started, I, I think we were, we were looking around. We wanted to be authentic. We wanted to tell a story that we believed inherently and you know didn't want to be talking about things that we didn't you know truly truly feel so authenticity was always like a hypercritical thing for us um, we really looked around and dove into what united our sort of thought processes or our perspectives it was curiosity was the main thing that really kind of united us we were all very intensely curious about the world and people and things and the way things work and all of us had a real drive to just and a thirst for knowledge so that ended up being our original sort of tagline that was outward facing. Um, and then we had a set of pillars at the very beginning that, uh, you know, professionalism was an important one to us and craft beer, and, you know, smaller breweries, there can be a culture of a little bit of excess and drinking. And so we always wanted to present ourselves with an air of just being professional and respectful and, and not, you know, sophomoric. And, and that I think has guided us well. Um, we, you know, we sort of uh, altered that one to a little bit of like moderation matters. So you know, if we, they've sort of evolved over time, but, um, you know, uh, the, uh, like citizenship came on pretty early. Like the notion of being a good citizen is a critical thing for a company, like thinking of a company like a citizen that, you know, has certain basic responsibilities to the community that they exist in. And over time, you know, that developed into, you know, a series of programs that we use to, you know, impact our community. We always had a notion that we wanted to be really involved in a lot of things here. I think craft breweries can be an amazing uh, touchstone for communities and hopefully lots of different kinds of people get to cross paths that maybe wouldn't normally and connect over a beverage that might, you know, lower some inhibitions. So uh, <laughs> there's, you know, that, that was always a notion, but it, you go through that gradation of figuring out what is it, you know, like asking yourself hard questions to get at it. And then wordsmithing is, you know, kind of the fun part for me. We like to be grammatical and and be very precise. So um, yeah, it's it's always a journey. You know, you try not to change too much of it. Every once in a while, you, you have a little edit to a, um, to a value. We had uh, people over product was ours. And then we uh, decided to try to make it more inclusive, literally, um, and change it to be for people. Um, and there's sort of a, a DE and I sort of undertone to that one now as well. So yeah, um, you know, you try not to change too much, but every once in a while you realize, oh, we missed something, you know? So. Um, so yeah, hopefully that covered it for you. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, the theme of this conversation really is quality. And again, we're talking about being, what, is, what does it mean to be a quality brewery, but also a quality company? Let's talk about quality brewery first. So this is going to Mal and Adam and Carrie, please jump in as well. But you know, quality is a massive concept that cuts across many facets of the craft beer industry specifically. If you're talking about beer, quality in terms of ingredients sourcing and quality assurance in both the laboratory and the manufacturing, it's consistency, it's shelf stability. Quality means a lot of different things. Um, would love to hear y'all unpack the term. We'll start with Mal. What does quality mean to you and how do you operationalize that 
and the brewery that you run. Yeah, so as a professional brewer, I've been a real student of quality and I think about our, you know, our core values at Bell's safety, quality, respect and responsibility. And I think quality is the one that often resonates most closely with the craft beer consumer, the drinker. And you know, how that, that concept of quality is something that has evolved over time. And if I look historically through some of the great thinkers in quality, Duran, Crosby, Deming, um, that, that, that has, again, evolved. Initially, when we think about quality, it's like, how many features does it, does it have? So you think back, this car has got all of these different buttons and horns and all these things. That's a higher quality thing than this very simple thing. That then try, starts to change to, does it meet specification? So you think, does it, you know, are the nuts the right size? And so there's a measurement of quality there that yes, we're hitting our targets and therefore this is a quality piece. Um, sometimes referred to um, this is, is also around fitness for use. And then the final place that I think where quality has really driven to is around what the expectation is. And I'm always fascinated. I drive around town and I look at the Wendy's hamburger sign and on the Wendy's hamburger sign, it says quality is our recipe. And you think <laughs> Wendy's, quality, what are you talking about? Now, here's the thing. I do not argue with that because if I walk into a Wendy's, my expectation is I'm probably going to get kind of a flaccid meat pie, you know, patty on a soggy bun. And when I'm delivered that very thing, I'm getting exactly what I expected. So at that point, quality is when execution meets or exceeds expectation. So my expectation is not particularly high. Now, they could deliver something of, you know, the, the filet mignon and I'd be overjoyed, right? But if I went in and ordered filet mignon and got that, that would not be quality. So I really think about an essential part of quality. And this goes to quality of experience. It goes to, to sort of any place where we talk about quality is have we adequately defined and communicated what we're going to do and then have we executed to it? Because in the absence, we have poor quality. So from that framework, that's the framework that I th think about quality in, in, in context with this discussion. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll throw it to you. Yeah, it's great. I mean, it's, it's really interesting to read about just the evolution of how, how that approach, you know, would change in, in manufacturing places over time. And I think it's come to, you know, for breweries, very highly specific things that we're measuring, tools that we use to be able to say whether or not it's, you know, it's meeting uh, our, our hamburger standard. So it's, uh, you know, I guess the way that we have approached it is uh, it has to be a lot driven by the operator. And that's like a key thing. You want the people that are doing the work to care about quality and not have an oversight committee that comes in and tells them they're messing up all the time. So it's like create fostering environment of ownership is a real, really critical piece for us. And it, it just kind of inherently was that because we didn't have a lot of people in the very beginning. So it was everybody's role and it should always be everybody's role to deliver quality. Um, you know, as you get a little bigger, you get fancier toys, but toys do not equal quality beer. You have to use the toys correctly and, uh, you know, do the right verifications and train people the right way. And so, you know, I, we kind of moved away from like, oh, we could be so much better if we just got this one tool or we could just afford this. and recognizing that you can do a lot for little to no money uh, in terms of quality. You know, there's a really sophisticated set of sensors right in your face that tells you whether or not a beer is good. Um, and being able to utilize that in a systematic way um, is an unbelievably powerful tool uh, for assessing the quality of a beer. Um, so, you know, you, have, you can get creative if you have, you know, limited funds for sure. Um, but, uh, you know, the people that are really, really good at it, it is a, you know, it is a streamlined and it, everyone participates in some way in guaranteeing that the thing is replicated over and over and over again. It's beautiful, really beautiful when it works well. So. And Carrie, just to kick it to you and also, would you talk about the four pillars quality being one of them? And would you talk about, you know, to a certain extent, like we've already kind of hinted at quality sometimes feels like a very subjective thing like this is a quality song or movie and this one isn't or whatever. Talk about what does quality mean within your role as executive VP and also as one of your pillars at Bells? Yeah, um, you know, I think as you hear the fantastic brewers in the room talk about quality and specs and those pieces, some of the other ways that it, you know, manifests itself when we talk about it here at Bells, 
being one of our core values is the quality of our relationships, the quality of our business partners, right? We extend that beyond things that you can tangibly measure. And we talk about that being how we interact and engage each other, our community, and those pieces. So I think that's an important expansion of how we think about quality as a business that has grown with us as our business has become more complex. Then if you think about the other three that John mentioned, which are safety, respect, and responsibility, you know, those, um, we used to have those initials essentially marked down the side of every whiteboard in the brewery, and that was the cadence for which we ran every meeting, right? We focused on the safety of our people first, and then sort of the morale or the respect factor. Then we went to responsibility and quality, and the lastly, we got to production, so if you think about, again, how that has transformed how we operate our business, that has really sort of put that marching order out there to say, here's the things we do, full stop, before we get to making great beer, right? These are the things and how we, how we act and how we engage and show up before we start making great beer together. That's awesome. Well, yeah, let's like start to drill down a little bit further into what I, you know, people are familiar with the term quality and can guess what it means within a brewery, but let's start to talk about a little bit more of the times, which is people are increasingly, consumers are increasingly, you know, caring about not only a quality product, but a quality process to create that product. And so now you're starting to introduce ideas of sustainability and doing things in a certain way. Um, so I'm going to really kick it to, to Walker for this one. You know, sustainability has found itself into the measure of quality and so how does bells promote quality or oh, sustainability as a measure of quality how do you operationalize that what are you paying attention to to say not only is this a quality beer in the glass but how it got there is a way that may, may, uh, maintains our standards quite a bit to unpack there which is great um <laughs> take it wherever direction yeah, you yeah. like <laughs> you know i think one of the the interesting pieces in your question and john's comments about meeting the expectation of the beer lover is the way that expe expectation has evolved. You know, we can do a lot to make sure you understand what's in the bottle. It's a pale ale, it's an IPA, it's going to have this type of hop characteristic. But there's also the expectation that the beer drinker brings to that experience and their expectation of the organization. And we've seen that evolve in a way where things like this type of collaboration this type of work around community, this type of work around environmental impact, that's increasingly an expectation of the consumer. And part of delivering quality in that, that measure of to the expectation of the end user is making sure that you are participating in bringing both your business and your industry forward in the way that you touch the communities you work in, the way you use your resources and the way those activities impact the, the greater natural uh, ecosystems, which is a really exciting pivot point in terms of what business means and what business can mean. And I, that just sort of came front of brain when you asked the question about how quality has, how sustainability has become part of quality. Doubling back on the question you really asked me. Um, <laughs> so, you know, a quality process is one that's uh, deliberate and effective, and those processes tend not to be wasteful. They they take uh, they they minimize the amount of waste generated, and from an environmental impact standpoint, there's really nothing worse than waste. Um, be it beer loss, be it you know direct energy loss, all of those have environmental impact with no return to the end user. That, that utilization of resources benefited no one because it, it came in the form of waste. So a process that's designed to be executed in a quality fashion tends to be one that treads lightly on the resources it consumes. So we try and make sure that the systems we use and the processes in place at the brewery are as effective and as efficient as possible and we also do a lot of work to make sure that we're, we're sharing those processes. That's one of the things you mentioned that's novel is that, you know, I am delighted to get a phone call, be it from Jacob or from Adam or from other to talk about how we address this one particular issue. And, you know, you and I and Ali spent the morning talking about how bells can move 
quickly towards B Corp certification. And just that type of collaborative environment and uh, cross-functional education capacity really helps move the needle forward on that front. And then finally, I would say the biggest challenge and where my mind goes most often is the challenge. I'd, I'd be super curious to you know hear your thoughts on this one, Fenwick, around how you functionally integrate the concepts of sustainability into every part of what it means to be a creature, to, to work at Bells, so that that experience is implicit and ubiquitous. Because um, I work for John, which means I have to learn to speak engineer, <laughs> um, which we're very good at the operational efficiencies, designing systems, but we also have to become very effective at making that part of everyone's experience. Mm -hmm. And that, that is yet another challenge, sort of how you bring sustainability forward in a way that perpetuates a quality business, as well as a quality outcome for the process. Mm -hmm. Adam looks like he has something to say that. Yeah, what, what does sustainability look like at Creature? And really for both of you, how is your brewery winning? in this area and where do you see opportunity for, for gain in this space? That's really interesting thinking about, I don't know, just how, how quality and, uh, and efficiency can not be at loggerheads. Cause we were talking a little bit of last night. It's like, sometimes if you don't have a resource, you can do something like turn up the CO2 dial on something and you're going to get less oxygen, but it's inherently less efficient. Um, but once, you know, once you level up a few times, you can start to find these synergies and, um, I don't know. Yeah, that is a true quality process. Should should not have waste. I love that concept. But um, uh, we have, uh, you know, it, d buying equipment that is very efficient is oftentimes more expensive. Uh, and so, as a startup, there are certainly challenges that are, um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of pulls to the money that you have left over to continue to grow or, or just buy equipment for the first time. Um, so it can be a challenge to spend the extra, you know, 20, 30% on a machine that is hyper efficient. Um, yeah, I, I think at the outset, we had some pretty good systems in place um, at a small brewery. But as we uh, built our new facility, we were able to make a lot of uh, things more inherent just to the processes that we're operating. We were able to uh, spring for an economizer on our, our natural gas boiler, which makes it super efficient for us to burn natural gas and heat our kettle. Um, you know, all LED lighting and, you know, purpose-built building for things that just flows better and works more efficiently. Um, you know, we've, I think as we have matured as a company, we have been able to put more resources and focus into efficiency. Um, quality was always hyper important. As a, as a small brewer, you have to be able to stack up to the bells of the world who have the fanciest stuff that exists. And, you know, there, it's, it's a challenge for sure to come across the consumer and it's, you know, it's not possible in every instance, but keeping your beer fresh helps. But, um, uh, you know, currently uh, I think we're doing a pretty good job on using renewables. Um, we're, we've got a lot of solar production on site and uh, between that and the credits that we're purchasing, we're, you know, depending on the day, 60 to 70% renewable energy uh, used at Creature Comforts. Pretty proud of that. I hope to be able to take it up to 100% very soon. Um, uh, we were, I, I, Walker and Jake are both talking yesterday. We have some challenges on our CO2 usage. And I think it kind of harkens back to us always wanting to deliver the top notch quality product that is extremely shelf stable. Beer is the, or oxygen is the enemy of beer. And so if you use more CO2, it pushes out oxygen. And so, you know, we have a little bit of a hangover of, uh, you know, too much CO2 usage. And there's an amazing tool um, that the subcommittee um, that Walker was co-chairing that I'm a member of um, has put out to let us benchmark the things that we do and how good we are at our resource utilization. You plug in your numbers and you're like, well, for breweries in your size class, you are really bad at CO2 usage. So there's probably some low hanging fruit there. So we have been on a journey to, to correct that. We've put some sub metering in place. Where's all this stuff going? Oh, we need to buy a flow meter to put in different places of the brewery to see where it's going, test you know, changes in process and correct. So that's that's part of the journey that we're on right now um, that I'm excited about. We're looking at a combined heat and power um, to have some on-site generation and, and, you know, electricity is not the most efficient form of energy. It turns out when you 
ship it a long distance, you get a whole lot of line loss. So actually on-site electrical generation is, is really efficient. So we're looking into that. But yeah, it's, a, it's something we've been able to devote more resources to. Um, we have a full-time person, Jacob Yarbrough, uh, who came from, uh, you know, from the very beginning, we've been able to promote to really focus on this stuff. And he's got a math degree from UGA and has a, you know, a process mind and can just zero in on these things and really find the things that we should be doing and investing in. So really proud of that. Um, but we, we've got a, we got a ways to go. We're not world-class by any means yet, um, but we're getting there. It's great to have a partner like Bells. Yeah, yeah, same question there, Walker. And, and Carrie, please jump in as well. I mean, especially Carrie, let's go Walker first, but then Carrie, but just to set you up, Carrie, you're the executive vice president. You have a lot of things coming across your desk. How does sustainability come across your desk and, and how do you kind of weight that and, and provide direction? But first to Walker, yeah, what are your wins? What are your opportunities? I am exceedingly proud and hopefully both of my bosses here with me feel the same way that, you know, we do a, a really great job inside of the brewery designing systems and equipment to be incredibly efficient. And we always, always, always do it in a way that pays back. We don't do anything that does not eventually validate its existence on the balance sheet. It's got, got longer paybacks than, you know, new tanks, more kegs, but um, that's always been super important to me that the, the business value of the work we're doing around sustainability is, is present in the work and upfront. Where we definitely have some, some opportunity to, to do a lot, lot more and a lot better is outside of the immediate scope of our brewery. So we can be really efficient with electricity. We're still on the sixth dirtiest grid in the country. So there's emissions with, associated with that. There's an enormous water and energy footprint inside of malt when it arrives at our door. So the packaging we use, again, a lot of embodied energy and associated greenhouse gas emissions there. And these are hard spaces to move the needle in because we are, we are big by craft, but we are not big by industry. And that's another space where I get excited about, you know, sharing rooms and projects and passions across businesses is that as a group, we have the opportunity to have a far louder voice in you know, the practices and the efficiencies that take place in the field, in the malt house, at the aluminum smelter, and so on and so forth. So that's a space where you know, to really have a dramatic consequence on the, the carbon intensity of our you know, whole life cycle we need to be able to be effective outside of the boundary of our physical building. And that's, that's really a big opportunity for us these days. Carrie, to you, where does sustainability turn up in your world and et cetera? Yeah, so I think, you know, I am fortunate and proud Walker to be clear um, <laughs> that- It's being know, recorded, we, right? It's yeah. <laughs> yeah. review season at Bell, so. It is. Uh, <laughs> When I think about, you know, how it shows up, you know, at my desk and John's really, right? It, it, it's an expectation of how we run our business. So when Walker talks about it being part of, you know, the projects and part of, you know, it's really in our DNA. So when John is delivering, you know, to us the priorities for how we build out and grow capacity, it's expected that there are, be it energy efficiencies or, you know, that we're making gains while we are doing that. So, in some ways, that makes my job pretty easy, if you will, to say yes to smart, passionate people. Um, so that, that, that ends up being what I do is sort of rubber stamp on the work really that, you know, comes out of Walker and Mallet and all those great, you know, brilliant minds. Um, but it's nice because I know that they're coming in from a space of the expectation is it's already there. It's built into the plan. So the takeaway there is hire great people. So I'm hearing, um, <laughs> but I love that you were, use the word DNA and we're gonna start to pivot now into what does it mean to be a great company? In the DNA of both Bells and Creature is this implicit idea in so many different words that essentially we say, we hope that we are participating in the vitality of our communities. The way we say it here is we hope Athens, Georgia is better because we're here, et cetera. <clears throat> Would love to hear really from anyone. Uh, you know, this is a jump ball, whoever gets to it first. Where did that start? Where did that idea of altruism or 
corporate philanthropy or corporate social responsibility or whatever your favorite term is, where did that start at Creature? Where did it start at Bells? This belief that our communities should be better because of our presence there. Adam. Uh, this thing's working, sweet. I was uh, talking to John about this earlier. Like, yeah, I think we did, we started pretty early, I think, uh, which, which people are interested in. Like, how, how did you do that? When, I mean, if you've ever been through a startup experience, it's <laughs> been pretty intense at times. It's, uh, everybody does everything. There's a lot of fires. And I, our first brew day was 32 hours. And I didn't, you know, didn't sleep during that time. I was running around getting machines going. Um, we, you know, I, I think we felt a little bit like outsiders, to be very frank. Uh, we were coming in from Atlanta and we wanted to be Athenians. So we wanted to hook into the community in any way, shape or form strategically, you know, like honestly, like we, we wanted to live here for a long time too. So we wanted to know people and, and just be a part of things that are happening here. Um, so that, that notion was very early on. We, you know, got the Athens farmers market on site, I think during the first year. Um, and, you know, we started, you know, we became aware of a lot of, you know, systemic issues that exist in our community. And as a brewery, you do get approached um, oftentimes to support, you know, functions. We, have, we make beer, so, you know, people like a fundraiser with beer. And so we were getting a lot of requests and we didn't have a decision-making framework to be able to say yes or no to anybody. And so that, um, that was a problem. And we knew that um, if we were unintentional, that we would have a less than optimal impact with our giving back. And so, uh, you know, credit Chris Heron was saying, we're gonna have to make some strategic no's um, in order to make a big yes. And so that, that was really the genesis. And then, um, you know, so from the outset, but I think it got more and more sophisticated as we grow like things do. And we uh, got Mr. Matt Stevens on, Miss Sally on later on, and it's grown to a place that we're, you know, really excited to, see move forward and, and continue to improve. Um, you know, and I'm sure we'll talk about some of the, the new stuff that we're working on, but yeah, it was a, it was an early notion um, that we needed to do something, so. I'd, I'd love to set the stage historically before uh, Carrie can key off of this, but you know, if I think about when Bell's first started, um, you know, Larry Bell was a student and didn't have much money. And in Kalamazoo, there's a, a, a group there called the, a company there called Kalamazoo Spice Extraction Company, Calsec, and they do quite a bit of work in hops. They've got some uh, some patents that are pretty interesting. And the founder of that, Paul Todd, had approached Larry, met him at a party, and Larry was doing some home brewing. He said, "I'd love to get some some home brews, you know, to have a couple little tests done." And so Larry went over there pre the brewery and made some small batches of beer. And I think his relationship with Paul Todd was really seminal because. Paul was a true polymath. Um, he, he wrote the patents for the, the, the technology that allows light to, or beer to be placed in clear glass bottles um, and you know, founded and run, ran a wonderful company. In addition to that, he was also a US congressman. In addition to that, he was the very first head of Planned Parenthood. And I think Paul's involvement in the community you know, for all this time, that was something to me that I, I, I believe that Larry looked at that aspirationally and said, that's a person I could be. And Larry started to do some of this work and the feedback I think really fed him. I'm gonna, Carrie, can you, can you take it from there? Yeah, absolutely. Larry talked a lot about that being, you know, having someone that mentor and Paul to, to really <clears throat> forge that path. And I think Larry gravitated to different things, right? Larry gravitated to music and arts. And you see that in our branding and our beer today. And, you know, again, that word DNA. Um, and, and that really is, you know, close to home for us. And we do a lot of work in our local community around arts and music and those pieces. And I think that that, you know, while, di while a different segment, of our community, um, in some ways, very complimentary. If you think about, you know, the work that Larry did and the work that Paul did before him. I love that you just kind of touch upon. Sometimes somebody needs to show us the way. Like we need to see that person. We need to see that company, which is why we love this collaboration so much. Is we get to see companies that are way further ahead, but down the same path that we want to go, and that provides not only inspiration, but some of the methodology that we can ourselves adopt and follow in the same. But sometimes it takes that that first, that pioneer, that, that example. So I love that we, that's part of Larry's story. I didn't realize all that. <clears throat> Let's talk about B Corps for a second, benefit corporations. I wanna hear from Allie. Um, you've mentioned it a couple times in passing. What is the B Corp? What is the benefit corp? 
Um, what is the certification? Why should these wonderful folks care about the certification in our process? Go for it. Yeah. So for those who are unaware of the B Corp certification, the easiest way I like to describe it as it would be what fair trade would be for coffee or what lead certification would be for green construction. And don't get me wrong, those are all very great certifications, but I think when we're looking at those certifications particularly, they're just very limited when you think of all of the different facets of what it takes to really be an ethical business. And early on, far before I got to Creature Comforts, these guys were, were looking at certifications and they were trying to figure out, all right, I mean, there's best places to work. You know, there's a lot of other certifications we could have considered. And B Corp really rose to the top for us as the gold standard of business as a force for good. And when I say that this report is thorough, like it is thorough, it is broken out into five different impact areas. So it looks at the way your company is structured. It looks at your community programs. It looks at how good of a steward you are for your planet, how you treat your people and your customers. So really every asset of the company it touches. And so we had the really wonderful opportunity to partner with UGA's B Collaborative program. Uh, so it was a group of MBA students here at the University of Georgia and through some wonderful connections from two folks that are in our audience. I see Nathan Stuck and Zach Godfrey here. So you can also pick their brains about it. But they got Creature connected with Be Local Georgia and that not Be Local Georgia, we love Be Local Georgia. Nathan's shirt really threw me off with the Be Collaborative program. And those students really worked with Matt and senior leadership at Creature to go through this assessment, right? And it is, it's a lot of work to go through the entire assessment and get that baseline score. And that all happened, gosh, in like fall of 2019. And they came back to us and said, we took the assessment and you guys are at 59 points. And let me just let you in on this. You need 80 points in order to certify and there are 200 possible points. So we had, we had our work cut out for us, but luckily the MBA students really paved the way for us to very easily plug in and get some of this work done. Um, I was also very grateful to have such a very bought in leadership team that was really pushing for the certification. We knew beforehand that we were doing some amount of good, like we were like, we're, we're a B Corp, but we just didn't know that until we went through the assessment. We really learned what our B Corp superpowers are in a sense, but also where we also as a company need to, to dig in and to do better. And I think this has been a wonderful tool for us, almost as some self-reflective of, you know, yeah, where are we doing well and where do we want to keep digging in? So we became a certified B Corp in summer of 2021, woo. It was a huge undertaking and we're already looking forward to our recertification date in April of 2024 to see if we can, I don't know, top and get New Belgium out of that number one spot. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see some friendly competition, but. So yes, and so from what I understand, Bells is now undertaking the process of exploring B Corporation certification as well. And yes, you have a fantastic new partner in New Belgium who has really set the standard when it comes to B Corp certified breweries. Um, but anyway, Walker, we tell us about how did B Corp come onto your radar and, and what does that process look like for you right now? B Corp probably came onto my radar three years ago. And I, I would give New Belgium credit there for, for raising that. The, the first time I ever heard of a B Corp um, was a presentation by Katie Wallace of New Belgium Brewing. And um, even when we were not actively pursuing certification, it has been a very useful tool to just go through the B impact assessment and see what some of the things are that, you know, are awarded high value points. So um, one of the, the genesis of some of the work we've been doing at Bells over the last year around developing a living wage was really born out of some of the questions in the B Corp, B impact assessment. So even before it was a, 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 a challenge, the, the challenge for us now, which is to, to bring ourselves to that 80 points, it, it's been a wonderful resource in some of the spaces 
you know, outside of environmental impact to give, throw some light on what might be, you know, an interesting avenue for Bells to pursue around community or governance, coworkers, all of those spaces. So it, it's been a very, very useful tool for us, even outside of the, the direct certification process. Mm -hmm. And then as I, as I see our journey starting around B Corp, one of the things that I've found really exciting, you know, I, I earlier talked about how you make this part of everyone's experience. And it does open up the opportunity for someone over in finance to be participating and HR to be participating. And the GM at our eccentric cafe, which is kind of like our snow tires, where we engage our customers and what their experience is like. And it, it, it creates avenues for participation for people who can sometimes find it more difficult to feel like their job is directly tied to the work we do around sustainability. It's uh, yeah, it, very much looking forward very much intimidated um, by the challenge, especially after talking to Ali and Matt about their experience. But um, fortunately, as, you know, as, as Matt's pointed out, B Corps tend to be very open and welcoming. And the, the, the same invitation to teach and learn that, that we've experienced through the Brewers Association and the NDAA seems to be part and parcel of B Corp certification as well. So we're looking forward to that process. And just for those who never heard of the term, I would strongly recommend you write it down, you Google it later, you would be surprised the national international brands that are B corporations that have been that way for a long time. But uh, let's like pivot into one of the specific um, attributes of a B corporation, which is those who are figuring out what does it mean to do good work in our community. I'm going to kick this one to Fenwick. Um, <clears throat> What does Preacher do in the community? And we've also been talking about this idea of evolution. What has changed over the years? What is changing in terms of what does community impact look like at Preacher and what's ahead? Since you're very much part of that team now, I would love to hear from you as a quote unquote new er Preacher, even though you've known us for a very long time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I almost feel like you should take the first part of the question. Uh, <laughs> what has community impact looked like for us? I mean, it, our, the mission of the Get Comfortable program, which, as Ali mentioned, is the flagship give back program, is to channel the generosity of many towards the areas of greatest need, greatest needs, greatest local needs. Um, and I, I highlight that S on purpose because I guess to the second part of your question, sort of how has that changed, right? But what that has looked like for us historically is pulling together philanthropic organizations, pulling together funders, really encouraging people to be having the same conversation. Um, Matt has this really beautiful graphic that he has developed for us and really reflecting visually what it is we've been trying to do with Get Comfortable. And on that graphic, I wish we could pull it up. It's, it's so compelling. Uh, the idea is that you've got multiple businesses, multiple uh, philanthropic organizations in a community and everybody's funding individual things based upon that barrage of requests that are coming to them. And ultimately in a space like that, you've got a lot of resources and a lot of energy going in a bunch of different directions. And ultimately what we've attempted to do with Get Comfortable is really to kind of knit those together to start pulling people in the same direction towards impacting change in these areas that we can actually document and measure over time. And ultimately the sort of change that I guess is taking place in the way that we approach our program is that we've gone from channeling the generosity of many towards the greatest local needs to channeling the generosity of many towards the greatest local need, singular, uh, which is not an easy conversation for us to be having as a community. Obviously all of the needs that are challenges in our community are worthwhile of the investment of all of the funders and all of the individuals who are willing to throw their support behind it. But we've taken the approach to fundraising and to giving that we hope more businesses will take, which is really the same sort of like rigor and, and, and the, the application of metrics and the expectation of a return on investment that businesses make with respect to their operations, we are applying that same rigor to our charitable work and really wanting to be investing in those things that we can measure progress inside of. And so the change that we have in, in, sort of introduced in our, our approach to philanthropic work in this particular year is we charge the advisory committee, which we maybe get a chance to talk about. You'll get to meet some of those folks even this evening if, if you join us over at the brewery. But we had a group of advisors that we pulled together from the very beginning. One of the commitments that Creature made was to recognizing that we are, we would, I guess we would like to think we're expert in the production of beer. I'm sure Adam is too humble to admit that he is an expert in the production of beer, but we knew what we could do well, which was to create a high quality liquid 
We did not assume that we had on staff the expertise necessary to identify what the greatest local needs were. And so recognizing that deficit, we brought together a panel of advisors to help us to answer those questions so that our giving wasn't being driven by the passion projects of our founders. We didn't want to be doing what they were committed to. We wanted to be doing what the community needed most. And so we brought folks together. We asked the people who had access to the data to join us at that table. We had the head of our Envision Athens program at that table. We had Dr. Grace Bagwell Adams, who's a fantastic professor in the College of Public Health here, who runs the Athens Wellbeing Project, bring that data to the table. We had Kay Keller from the United Way. We had uh, from the Athens Area Community Foundation. We had all of those folks come down to sit at the table with us. And we asked them to help us identify what it was that we should be funding. And this year, we pro provided an additional challenge to them, which was, we're going to narrow this down. In, in previous years, we've supported a lot of different things and supported agencies operating in a lot of areas. We've implemented that creature within the last year. And we refer to, I mean, I think it's referred to in the book as an operating system, uh, the four disciplines of execution, uh, which is a book I would also highly encourage folks consider reading. Uh, but we implemented that as a company. And inside of that system, the presumption is that like, you can really only be focused on one or two goals at a time. Everything can't be a priority. You've got to singularly focus on the thing that you're most interested in impacting. And once you've identified what that most important thing is, you set measurable targets for yourself. And in the language of this book, it's X to Y by when. So we took that framework and said, what if we applied that to our community work? What if once we identified what that need was, we said, what's our X to Y by when? And that's what we challenged our advisors to help us answer. What is the single most important thing we could be working on amongst all the myriad needs that we could be addressing? And once we've identified that thing, what is the measurable change that we should be committing ourselves to over a period of time? And we're gonna go all in on making that change take place. So that's, I guess, as we talk about evolution, right? Like that's the evolution is really moving in the direction of return on investment for the impact that we're hoping to make in our community. And I mean, the United Way, I see my boy Mark here, the United Way of America has a mantra that I love uh, this is like the broader United Way, but their idea is what, get, what gets measured gets done. And I feel like that's ultimately what we're trying to do with our program is we, we were, we're very, very pleased to say that we have mobilized millions at this point of dollars to impact our local community. Now we want to be able to point to the change that those dollars are bringing about and applying a level of rigor to our community work that previously we, we were moving in the direction of, but hadn't yet arrived at. Now we're really happy to say that that's where we were firmly planted ourselves. And just an addendum, addendum to that, we would be remiss to not say, in addition to Creature Comforts going all in and, and building these partnerships and doing all the things that we do, it has also been in combination with dozens of other local businesses that have chosen to essentially trust us yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and start to coordinate their philanthropic activity alongside us. And through that we thing, not just the, the yeah. Creature thing, but the we thing, we have seen yeah. some incredible um, engagement. I think that's the novelty, Matt. I mean, that's something we've talked about a lot, right? Like what's really novel about the approach that Creature has taken. And I think one of the reasons that the businesses who have chosen to line up with us have chosen to line up with us is that we took ourselves out of the conversation when it came to identifying what the priorities were going to be. We didn't come together as a group of creatures and say, yeah, we should fund this because Adam loves this. You know what I mean? Like we're, we're not supporting things that, that are near and dear to our hearts. We're letting the data decide for us. And other businesses, I think, are intrigued by that idea. It's like, oh, man. And it's back to the strategic no conversation, right? Like, you've got to say those strategic no's in order to say the greater yes. If you've got data as the sort of determining factor for saying those no's, then nobody can really blame you. Oh, I lost my mic. I don't think I need it, but I'll make sure I'm connected. <laughs> um, but the data really does. It, 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 it takes... It, it takes the ball out of your court in some respects, and it really does. It gives the folks who would otherwise feel a little bit, feel funny about some of the choices that you're making. It's like, no, no, no. Like, this is what our experts, the panel of experts and the data is suggesting that we should be funding. And we hope folks will line up with us. And so far, that's been the experience. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, its tagline is always, we need to remain as dispassionate yeah. as the data. <laughs> and that's really what we strive yeah. to do when we get these experts around the table is yeah. to have them report out on what they know and what they're good at. And once we have those needs, you know, needs assessment data and those local priorities ahead of us, it's really hard to say no to the data. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm gonna zoom back out. I only have a few more questions for whatever it's worth. Um, if you're in the room, we would love to hear your questions as well. And so let me at least to start to guide your attention to there's a microphone there and one over there. And we would love to uh, hear your questions in just a couple minutes. I only have a few more. Um, let me zoom out a little bit. So back to the B Corp 
the core three questions, what's good for our community, what's good for the environment, what's good for our people. Would love to hear from you, Carrie, and you, Fenwick, and whoever else. How does, how does Creature Comforts, how does Bells invest in its people? How do you become a great place to work who's not only doing quality products out into the world, but is being quality company to your quality people who call your company home? What does that look like? I'll start with you, Carrie. I haven't heard from you for a second. How do you invest in your people? Well, I think, you know, we take the approach that we want to be able to take care of our folks, whole, you know, holistically. So certainly that is Walker, you, you know, living wage, certainly that is around benefits, but it's also being creative and meeting people where they are, I think is an important part of that. And then if you talk about some of the things that Mal and I hold, hold dear, uh, you know, we're, we're a company now with New Belgium of, you know, 1300 coworkers. So, you know, not everybody that comes and starts at Bells finishes their career here like Mallet and I, <laughs> like us lifers and Walker too. Um, so we really strive to have what we call a teaching college approach that we take, meaning when our folks come in, we want to teach them about those core values, how you run a business that way, and then hope that they take those learnings, you know, should they be, be grow beyond Bells, and many have, we've had brewers everywhere, I feel like, um, across the country and then they make the community the craft beer community better but as I think about some of the things that are maybe not talked about a lot from a how you care for your employees much of it has to do with how do you support them around mental health you know an issue that's not easy to talk about how do you support women in beer and in with what you know say we face that is different than and marginalized population space that is different than other folks and I think being courageous to have those conversations, to make space for those as a part of how you run your business is really important. We have a sign on every door that says open all and everyone knows what that means, right? When you walk up and we have our, you know, rainbow tap handles across, you know, for the whole month of June, for example, right? We are very visible about being an opening and welcoming community. And that really attracts and retains, frankly, fantastic folks. And what I love that it speaks to Carrie, and I'm going to parrot Blake Tires, who said this years ago. I don't even know if you recall saying this, but at one point, Blake just offhandedly said, gosh, the pub, the public house, the brewery, whatever, it has historically been that crossroads of humanity. Um, and we just want to take that mantle and preserve it in Athens, Georgia in 2022 and beyond, right? So anyway, I just, I love, I love everything you just said there. Fenwick, to you, yeah, what does, uh, how do we invest in our people at Creature? How do you, how do you answer that question and, and how do you operate? operationalize it as well yeah i mean i think starting and i'll use your word operationalizing i mean i think we're pretty intentional about ensuring that our values aren't just beautiful statements that live on a wall somewhere that we take those seriously uh, that we've done the hard work in fact in the past year i mean there was a committee of creatures from across the company who were involved in the work of really operationalizing those values right like what are the behaviors that align with these values not that that is an all-inclusive and exhaustive list but really like getting some specificity around this, right? I think Katie Beecham said anything short of that and then your values become like a cat poster, right? It's like, we, we absolutely have to do the hard work of turning those values into practical expectations for people. And I think that that's something we take very seriously. I think Creature also does a fantastic job of like skills transfer and career development. And we've got, I mean, we've got folks who are running our brewing operations at this point who started off as taproom employees. Like there's been a tremendous amount of mobility at Creature. And I think that attracts people into the company with this sort of excitement and expectation that, man, like I can start anywhere and end up at a place I can't even imagine yet because there is such opportunity and such intentional transfer of skills taking place. Um, I think one of the things that I also see us doing is moving more and more, moving further and further in a direction of just kind of like open book management principles and really sharing more and more throughout our company about how decisions are being made at the top, inviting more voices in, like creating space in leadership conversations for folks from all over the company to be participating in some of the discussions that previously and in other companies perhaps would be happening behind closed doors in a very limited space, that opening it up and being more intentionally inclusive of the variety of voices. Uh, we also do a lot in the benefits to Carrie's point, right? Like we're pretty proud of some of the benefits that we offer to our employees. We cover 80% of 
health insurance premiums, 100% of dental and vision. We do dollar for dollar 401k match. We got a smart dollar program. So we've got financial literacy training available for any creature who wants to avail themselves of that. We also do free counseling sessions through our employee assistance program. And so we're very proud and always on the lookout for new benefits that we can be offering to really ensure that our package meets the needs of our employees. We've got a solid, a fantastic new HR director who's working on exactly that, ensuring that what we have to offer to employees is really meeting the needs that are being communicated to us. Um, and ultimately, I mean, I think this goes back to one of the value statements that Carrie alluded to and Adam mentioned as well, like really caring more about the person than the position that they're in. Um, that's something that our CEO says a lot, like we care far more about the individual than the position. And I think that that's borne out in the level of care and support that we show to our employees and the space that we try to create for them to bring their whole selves to work on a consistent basis and feel like they're going to be welcome with whoever they are and however they choose to show up. Well, y'all, this is my last discussion prompt. So if there are questions in the audience, now will be a good time to go stand behind one of those mics. But um, let's just go down the line for this one. One of the, one of the values of Creatures, uh, Creature Conference is to leave a legacy, to set your successors up for success. That's how we like to say it, whether that's generationally or just that person coming behind you and at that workstation or whatever. Um, what is the legacy? What is it that we want to be? What do you want the company to be remembered for? And maybe even more personally, if you want to go to the personal angle, what's the legacy that you want to leave? That's my last prompt. Carrie, Adam has uh, recommended that you go first. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be harder to go last for fun week anyway, I think. But, um, you know, as I think about this question really struck me. I think we're in a moment of, you know, pivotal change here at the brewery going from family ownership to, you know, now this executive team really trying to merge and be, you know, force for good. And I think about my personal legacy um, and no one's really asked me that question. So it was nice to be asked, to be fair. Um, my hope is really that I can inspire other women in particular to be brave and empathetic leaders for change in our industry. That is something that matters a great deal to me. I don't want to be one of only a few women who help run a brewery, you know, a large brewer as a, as a force for good. I certainly hope that by the time I am not at Bells anymore, not in this industry, that that will not be quite as novel as it is at the moment. I think you're already achieving that legacy, by the way. So that's a fantastic answer. We'll just keep going on down the line, Adam. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, I, um, I realized along somewhere along the way that I really, really like pouring into people and, and teaching them, you know, things that I feel like they need to know to do their job. And as we've grown, like I've cycled through a lot of direct reports and I've found that um, giving people tools is one of my favorite things or just skills. So um, I, I hope to leave behind just a bunch of crushers that can be just, you know, amazing business people, brewers, you know, and citizens. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's incredibly rewarding to be able to do. And, and when you see, uh, you know, something that you've built really running, you know, like a clock in your absence, you're like, yeah, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, so I want to continue to do a whole lot of that personally. Um, it's, it's really fulfilling. And then, you know, as an organization, I, I just had a baby, so maybe she wants to be a brewer one day. I don't know, but, uh, well, uh, I, I hope that this place is better for it. Um, I hope that, a lot of places that we operate are just better off in, in many different ways um, and that people are happy to have us here. So, yeah. For my part as a organization, I, I hope that we're able to leave the legacy that it can be done, that you can run a successful business in a way that does not have to contribute to irreversible climate change. Mm -hmm. And that that is a thing that can be successful. For me personally, and forgive me, I always get emotional when I talk about my kids, but um, I am still pessimistic about what the future looks like in regards to climate change. And I hope the legacy I get to leave is, you know, when I see them, I can tell them like, I really tried. It may not have worked out, but it wasn't because I wasn't trying. So if at the end of the day, that is what I can accomplish personally in that space, that alone will be successful for me. It's a great answer. Alan. I think about, um, you know, what, what goals are we trying to achieve? And I think about 
Bell's and large organization now to be leaders, to be empathetic leaders that develop people to potential for operational excellence and for how we treat each other and the planet. And that really is a legacy that that would be tremendous to be involved with in any form, and that's something that I, I, I feel like we are we are on track with. You know, we are really changing uh, the way that the craft beer lover um, interacts with with organizations, and, and and hopefully the development of the people within that organization to really succeed and get to their personal goals. I would say as cliche as it sounds, I really hope to be remembered as someone who really tried to leverage her talents and skills to make her community better. Uh, and at Creature Comforts, and this is something that Matt said at the beginning, I mean, we want to years down the road, maybe it's 5, 10, 40, 50, but we want people to think to themselves, Athens is a better place because Creature Comforts is here. Athens is better because Creature Comforts created jobs that paid not just a living rate wage, a thriving wage. They created jobs with dignity. You know, they took care of their people. They gave back to the, the community. They were good stewards of their environment and the town that they have. And that's what I personally think the legacy of Creature, just looking back as a, you know, down the road, I would be absolutely thrilled if that's, that's what people thought when they thought of Creature Comforts, like, wow. This place is better off because this craft brewery decided to be headquartered here. Bring us home, if they might. Ask, yeah, right. I'm like, thank. As Carrie predicted, it is incredibly difficult to follow all of those answers. Uh, I think I'm going to echo a little bit of what Alice just said. I mean, my hope is that, and to harken back to the commitment that Creature made from the beginning, we wanted Athens to be better because we were here. Like, my hope is that we will be able to look back and say that this place is measurably and discernibly better because not just qualitatively, but quantitatively better because we are here because of some of the commitments that we made and the very intentional focus that we applied to the work that we did, that that would be a fantastic thing for us to be able to say. And then secondarily, and, and this is just my own sort of like personal passion and hope is that at a certain point, my desire is that the workforce, the workforce of Creature will be reflective of the diversity in this community. Um, I have seen and heard firsthand, and this is mostly anecdotal, but I, it comes you know, from a good source, a reliable source that you know, I, I've heard stories about folks getting jobs at Creature and within a year being able to purchase their first home. Um, we've got a crisis in our community. And I think that home ownership as a pathway to the accumulation of wealth in some of our under-resourced communities um, is, is a fantastic thing for us to have in the foreground. And I would love for that to be something that we are, that an, an opportunity for employment at Creature with all the professional advancement and all the financial gain that comes along with that, I think would be, I would love it if we could look back by the time I leave Creature, whenever that ends up happening and say, yeah, that company looks like the community in which it is, which, and I think that change happening in our company would drive that change in our industry, which at this point doesn't look like a lot of me or Carrie or Allie, and so is ripe for that kind of change. And I really hope to be a part of helping to bring that about. This is why they're sitting over there, and I'm just one asking. <laughs> Wait, I was going to say, do you get to do you get to skip that question? Yeah, I'm the moderator. I'm just oh, that doesn't moderator. seem right to me. <laughs> I would love to hear the question. Of this. <laughs> I'll wrap up with that. I'll wrap up with that. <laughs> Okay, first off, welcome to Athens. Even though you are from Atlanta, that's not too far away, but welcome. And thank y'all. Um, I'm not a business person. I am listening to all this through the lens of uh, teaching. And I was really drawn to, I think it was Walker, who was talking about sustainability and quality. And I think you said, excuse me, I forgot to put my readers on. I, thought, I think you said it's really important to minimize waste. And I hope I'm not letting the cat out of the bag, but this city and this town, um, they have a lot of waste. They have a lot of children and a lot of people who aren't getting what they need to make their lives um, successful. I bring all those words back together. And although we don't think about uh, waste as children in mind um, as waste, I do think there's a lot of intersections between 
because we know that business is happening. We can't speak to the dollar quality about thinking about what y'all do and how we can be there for you in the last few years of this pandemic so that all our donors can have the opportunity to make that decision. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Yeah, you can applaud that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That means a lot. And for whatever it's worth, if you want to hear the deep dive into what literacy has to do with all this, please do trek with us. I'll set you up for, for that direction here in a second, but I want to hear from Jesse. What's up, man? Hey, what's up, bro? Um, quick question for anybody. Uh, also, just as a craft beer nut, uh, really cool to be sitting here listening to a panel between, uh, you know, Bells and Creature. It's pretty rad. So. Thank you guys for the hard work it went in to show up in this moment. Um, anyone is open to this to share. I'd love to hear um, any anecdotes you have or guiding principles or thoughts, especially the ones that have been forged through fire as you've been growing as organizations around leadership. Are there any, you know, regardless of what background that we're coming from in here, the work that we do with our hands, if this room's full of leaders. And we either current or future. And we're, I'd love to hear from your own experience, what are some of those guiding leadership thoughts, principles, anecdotes uh, that have just kind of been a plumb line for you as, as you've been a part of this growing, both of these growing organizations? So it's pretty wide open, just talking about leadership. Yeah. Give me some wisdom. Yeah. Well, uh, we're lucky to have Mr. Chris Edinger in the audience today uh, who trains us to be leaders at Creature Comforts. So I've got a hack. I know all the tricks because he's just taught them to us. But um, yeah, I think a key is knowing yourself and then leading yourself. So figuring out where you fail and then making a plan to fix where you fail. It's really simple. Like, and saying it is really simple, but like actually, you know, facing hard facts about yourself can be really difficult for some people. And you know, not just facing it, but also, you know, creating that alarm bell in your head to repair it whenever that tendency creeps in to say, uh, okay, I, I always notice it when this happens, and then I do this instead of that. So changing your reality, you know, through changes of actions that are kind of applied to you personally. And then uh, the other big one is just being for other people like to like really want the best outcome for the person that you're leading and from a fundamental like I, you know I, I have to have a hard conversation with you because it's the best thing that you need to hear right now and having that wisdom it takes time to know when somebody needs to hear that thing but yeah being for people and then you know fixing your tendencies is, is the two big ones for me. Uh, yeah I once heard it said that leaders who last are those who lead themselves first. Um, and with that in mind, and just to kind of tag that same idea, uh, another just brilliant idea. I think if we can keep our eyes on what we value most over what we want now, if we can prioritize what we value most over what we want now, I think the great leaders of the world who not only leave legacies in the world, but also leave legacies in their family and for the people who know them. I think there's a difference sometimes between, if you will, the great man and the good man. <laughs> And I think one can be both a good man, if we're going to use the term man, and a great man at the same time. And that is to say, I think great leaders really do figure out what do I value most? And sometimes what I want right now is in conflict with that. And they figure out a way to choose those deepest desires over those strongest desires, if you will. It's more personal leadership type stuff, but I think that's what great leaders do. That's my take on that one, Jesse. <laughs> other final thoughts otherwise y'all have 11 minutes <laughs> so we should all out. just wax poetic on jesse's question yes. since it was the last <laughs> one right <laughs> i mean i think yeah, i'll piggyback on some of what adam was saying and i mean we're all going to sound like sort of total giant fanboys up here but <laughs> chris ediger and, and the the giant framework has really helped us and i think you know in addition to the idea of like using self-awareness as a guide and 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 like one of the, I guess the, one of the taglines in the training that we all go through, right, is the responsibility of the leader is to be the healthiest person in the room. Um, I really love this idea, though, of really being consistent across what in the giant world is referred to as like spheres of influence. Um, like I think it, 
an unfortunate tendency if we're accidental, right, is to think that we can show up in one space and be a certain kind of leader and not be that same kind of leader across the various spheres inside of which we exercise influence. And in, in Giant, they talk about, obviously you start with the self and what kind of leader am I being for me? Then what kind of leader am I being for my family? Then what kind of leader am I being for my team, my organization, and lastly, my community? And the goal is to be a liberating leader across those spheres. I can't dominate in one and expect to liberate in another one. If I'm dominating myself, I'm not gonna be able to liberate others, right? So like continuity and consistency across the spheres of influence and having, again, to Adam's point, just that self-awareness, understanding what our tendencies are. Like, when am I being triggered? What are the things that are activating me? When am I showing up and being unhealthy? And how can I correct those sorts of behaviors so as to maximize the influence that I get to have on the people I get to lead? So I, I guess the only thing I would add to what Adam said, right, is just that idea that that self-awareness is important in all of our relationships, starting internally and then working its way out with community being the sort of outermost circle. Well, if there's nothing else here, if you want to journey Matt, with us. Matt. Oh yes, yes, oh yes, John, <laughs> sorry. I want to hear from John for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, pl pleasure to be here. You know, I've got, I've got kind of a goofy thing and, and that is that, you know, at, at, at my home office, I've got a, a postcard that has got a quotation on it. It was gifted to me when I was a much younger person by a peace activist from, from World War II actually. And he was nonviolent resistor and recognizes sort of how nonviolence works and how that approach, that mental approach, and I think one of the, the seminal pieces in there is just the recognition, the deep recognition of the inherent worth and dignity of every living being. And that's been a guiding principle for me from, from day one of, I may not agree, but I can be respectful. And that's, you know, hopefully manifests itself in the ways that I approach everybody through the value chain, through the business, through my family, through, through all of those aspects. It's just like a little quirky thing, but it's something that has really just hung, hung with me. I have deep respect for Wally Nelson and, and all he stood for. And, and he still impacts me to this day, so. I don't wanna step on anybody. That's a great way to play in the plane though. Um, <laughs> Well, y'all, thank you so much for an hour and a half of your time to join us today for the Wilson Center event. Thank you again to the Wilson Center, to the Innovation District for setting this entire thing up and really tracking with us, not this just, just this year, but for the last several years. And additionally, if you want to continue the excursion, um, about 30 minutes from now in our tap room, uh, we will be talking about the beer. We will be serving the beer for the first time, the collaboration between Creature and Bell's this year's Get Comfortable IPA 2022, but we will also be giving a bit more and a shorter bit of context on what is the program, what, is it had been, what has it been, and really what is in store, and how did we get there, and what can you expect next. So if you can't join us, no worries, but if you can, please trek with us, and we'll see you in 30 minutes at Creature Comforts. And if you are not going to be joining us, please do stick around and just walk around this place. It is fabulous, and thank you again to the Innovation District for housing us. Y'all are free to go. Thank you.